afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's installment of C-Suite Snacks. My name is Steve Ronan, the host of today's webinar and the leader of Citroen Cooperman's Consulting and Outsourcing Practices. Every Thursday at noon, we bring you snack-sized insights on a timely topic delivered by experts in the field. Today, uh, we have a topic that is very specific to this space and time. We're joined by David Lewis, a national thought leader on talent and HR and the founder and CEO of Operations Inc to talk about considerations for reopening your workplace uh, after COVID. A few administrative reminders before we start. We accept questions throughout the webinar. So please look at the bottom of your Zoom screen and locate the Q&A button. Please feel free to put your questions in there as we go. Some of those we may answer during the course of today's discussion and others we may reserve for the end Q&A period. Uh, so please uh, just use that to submit questions uh, as you think of them and it'll, uh, we'll have a nice discussion on them at the end. Additionally, we'll be doing our traditional snack basket giveaway today, where a lucky attendee will win a craft basket of snacks. The winner will be announced at the end of today's session. Uh, so please stick around for the announcement and so that we can reach out and get mailing information. In an effort to expand this series and bring you even more snack-sized insights, we've recently rebranded to C-Suite Snacks. And uh, you see that on today's webinar, and we'll see that in the coming weeks on our invites. Finally, if you're here because you found out on our website or social media, I encourage you to sign up for our mailing list. You will receive an invite for our new topics every week, as well as replays to the webinars and links to the decks. So you can find that link to sign up for our email uh, list on our webpage, our C-Suite Snacks webpage. And you can also visit our content hub there to view previous sessions, uh, decks and recordings. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to David to begin today's session. David, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Lewis. I'm CEO of Operations Inc. I'm going to share my screen now so that we can focus on the slides here and uh, you'll see me up in the corner. Um, so our, our presentation today is entitled Roadmap to Reopening, Preparing for the Workplace in a Post-COVID World. Uh, and I think everybody is sort of feeling this already. And if you're not, then it's time to start paying attention to how much the workplace really has changed uh, already and is going to be in a sustained um, position of change come the point that it's safe to reopen our offices in what we view as sort of the normal pre-COVID um, format. And I'm going to dive into that uh, during the course of today's session. Um, so just a little bit about our organization. Operations Inc. is one of the largest human resources consulting practices in the U.S. and the largest in the state of Connecticut. We um, have been in business just a little over 20 years now, supporting over 1,800 clients across 70 different industries. We have a team of 80 actually closing in on 90 HR professionals now with deep subject matter expertise. And everything that I'll be covering today and discussing today really ties into things that we as a practice are guiding and directing our clients to do. Um, we're thought leaders within the HR space on a national scale. Um, you'll often see our information out there in the mainstream media, in the press, um, and certainly information that we publish. And we're happy today to share our perspective with all of you, give you a little bit of uh, insight uh, and understanding into the things that your organization should really be thinking about going forward. Um, on the vaccine side, to just dive right in, um, you know, we get a ton of questions and we're continuing to get a ton of questions as it relates to vaccinations. Um, and, and the first thing I'm going to hone in on here today is how we're starting to see the new trend come out where, in short, getting vaccines and having your employees get to the point where they're, let's say, two weeks past full vaccination is not enough for many of those employees to get to a full comfort level that matches the way they thought about coming to the office, say, in January of 2020. There is a significant amount of psychological hesitancy, as well as a significant amount of hesitancy in general tied to concerns around what it really means in terms of protection for them to just be vaccinated. And it's the first and key point I wanna make here around vaccines because there's been so much emphasis placed on this idea that once shots go into arms, things will return fully to normal. Um, we are dealing with a lot of companies right now who are already starting to talk about opening their offices in as soon as May or even June of this year, and have already started to realize through backlash from their employees that this is not as simple as getting everybody vaccinated. 
With that said, timing's gonna vary on those people in terms of who does and who does not. There are gonna be people that will not wanna take it and people that will be advised not to take it due to medical concerns. And some are gonna wait longer than others based on demographics, based on availability, based on just even not really wanting to deal with the extraordinary circumstances around getting an appointment. Um, and it's still, some people are just not going to feel safe. Um, we certainly work with a wide range of some of the top employment lawyers in the country um, and have a great relationship with that market. And with that said, while we're not lawyers and we fully understand what they are doing in terms of educating companies and individuals on what you can and can't do as it relates to vaccinations and your employees, we're not really in that boat. We are really focusing our clients um, on the idea that this isn't the time to start considering who you can fire based on whether they did or didn't get vaccinated or who you can force into the office and not force into the office. We think these questions are going to get mostly resolved um, through um, exercises from uh, the um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA at the federal level who are on the sidelines at the beginning but under this administration are likely to take a more active approach towards setting guidelines for businesses alike across the country. And they're gonna guide the states. In fact, most state governors are waiting right now on the federal government to provide additional guidance to them before they alter any opening guidelines they have as it relates to workplaces. So our advice is for companies to spend less time looking at all of the what ifs and starting to stress themselves out about what they can or cannot do and focus their attention instead right now on preparing for the post COVID workplace, less about um, vaccines, more about other matters. So those other matters in our view involve putting together um, a task force, getting um, a group of um, HR, C level and leadership folks together and starting to talk about what the workplace is going to look like. And a lot of organizations have already started to do this informally or formally. But the idea is to try to assemble a list of, um, um, of items to address, to resolve and strategize and establish some type of a plan of attack. We advise companies to do that sooner rather than later. Um, we've been pushing the idea of a task force actually since January um, and have that group initiate research and explore things on key issues ranging from who comes back to the office to who's gonna be allowed to work from home down to even just what you're gonna do as far as your long-term strategy for running your operation is concerned. One of the key components, which I'll circle back to during the course of today's presentation is getting input from your employees. Um, this is the time to get as much communication going on a bi-directional level so that your employees don't feel dictated to and don't feel outside of the process as it relates to making decisions about the company's future. With that, asking those questions is very much an art versus a science. There are ways to ask it. There are questions to and not to ask. And in short, the strategy really should be focused on asking questions where you can consider what the possible answers will be and you have the ability to respond to what you think those answers could be. Don't ask people, for example, if they wanna work from home if you have no intention of providing them with the opportunity to do so on a long-term basis or once the post-COVID sort of world hits here. But I would take the time to poll people as an example and then use that time that you have to be able to take that feedback and map out a proposed plan. And then lastly, develop and execute um, uh, and, uh, and a, a rollout or communication of that plan to your organization. Now, it's March the 18th. Um, and it may feel like you, you're a little bit rushed here, we're still focused on um, and have um, advised our clients to consider September roughly the 6th or thereabouts. I think that's the first work day um, of September after Labor Day to have that be sort of the day you circle for having people come back into the office. Um, some organizations may look to do this sooner. And of course, some organizations never close their offices at all. But for those of you who have been operating with a skeleton crew or limitations as it relates to office openings, we're looking at that timeline for a variety of reasons. We think it will take that long for vaccines to be fully distributed. And we do think it will take that long for organizations to have the right level of guidance to make educated decisions. This is not the time in our opinion to be the lead um, organization. 
in moving um, to openings or in establishing procedures or protocols. This is the time to follow uh, and taking your lead from um, federal and state government initially, in our view, is the best advice that we can uh, and are providing these days. Pivoting to the remote work issue, you know, this is a difficult decision to make today, certainly in comparison with what we were forced to do uh, March a year ago um, in 2020. Because back then you had no choices in many instances, depending on the nature of your business. But for most of us today, we do. And we need to determine you know, what roles can be performed remotely. Um, a lot of that is a subjective standard, but you know, being consistent and being clear on what those guidelines are is absolutely paramount for every organization. If you are not consistent in your application of who does and who does not get to work remotely, and if it is not clear, those are all going to open you up to significant liability and complaints from those employees in your populations, which we're obviously in a position of trying to keep our clients away from any type of liability and be as risk averse as is possible. So if they're going to work remotely, is that going to be all the time or some of the time? And how are you establishing what those guidelines are? And again, how are you going to defend those classifications? All critical components of a task force and ultimately of the decision making exercise. Are you gonna put all this in writing? Most organizations should, but again, written policy, if it's written well, gives the company optimal flexibility, but also gives them something to fall back on. And how are you defining the percentage of the departments in your organizations that must work from the office and who those people are? Again, you're gonna be held accountable to defend those decisions to those individuals. And any inconsistencies are going to potentially create liability for your company. Um, you know, the, they're, they're going to be pushback from employees as well about the commute that they used to take and haven't been taking for the past year. One of the questions around that is, is the time consumed commuting, some of which is now very productive work time, is it worth it? And how do you balance that? Can a manager lead from home? Can you have management people out of the office? We've had them for the past year. So again, consider the strong statement that a lot of organizations may immediately react when I ask that question, say, well, of course, managers have to be in the office. Well, why? If managers have been effectively managing their teams remotely to this point, is that something that they can continue to do? So it's not always necessarily as definitive as an answer as probably many organizations provided around these questions prior to COVID. And then on the onsite requirement side, if you are going to ask people to come in at some point, what frequency, weekly, monthly, quarterly. I'll throw another twist in there. Make sure that you're budgeting for the expense associated with all of this. So IT wise, doubling up on keyboards, on the dual monitor setups that people have, on whatever equipment they have poached from the office that are now using at home, those people who are gonna work two days a week from the office are gonna need a place to sit with comparable equipment. You need to account for that. I'll give you another twist. If you bring those people to a full remote existence today, are you cutting their salaries because they no longer have the expense associated with commute? That sounds a little bit crazy and controversial, but organizations have started to consider if not implement that. Or on the other side of this, if a year after you've made somebody fully remote, you now require them to come to the office, maybe even because they've chosen to apply for another position within the company and they transfer to that role and now they have to commute. How are you going to account for and accommodate the fact that their costs to get to and from the office effectively add 10% of, to their costs and now they want a 10% increase? These are variables you're gonna to have to work out and keep on your radar as a whole organizationally. We had some interesting phenomenon occur during the course of COVID where employees literally relocated themselves, what sounded like a temporary thing, but turned into a permanent one. Well, that's becoming a pretty significant issue as we're starting to get looking to see the horizon for what normal may look like in a post-COVID workplace. So now you've got people who've moved. Well, did you have a handbook policy on address changes? Most of us do buried somewhere in there. It never was intended for this use, but it's a good place to start in case you're going to plan to ask those people who have moved to come back or you're going to use it as a reason for terminating their employment because you're gonna require them to have to report to the workplace. Part of your survey that you may do in your outreach to your employees could include a communication to 
asking them um, uh, what their return to office path, plan or path may look like, and even asking them where they're presently located if they're not located in the address that is listed on their paycheck. But you need to deal with um, handbook policies around this as well if you don't have them. A lead time to allow for this to work itself through, I think is key, meaning if you're gonna ask people to come back, you need to give them some reasonable time to be able to do so. There is no legal standard for that, but you're gonna hear that term reasonable um, being thrown around a lot very casually without giving you a lot of guidance on how to judge exactly what reasonable looks like. Do your benefits cover the markets your employees have relocated to? Most of us are dealing with national carriers, but not necessarily all of them. That's a key thing because it's not just that it's gonna cost the employee more to have to do out of pocket expense because they're not in an area where the network reaches them, but those people are going to weigh heavily on your benefit costs the next time you renew because out of network costs more and doesn't have the same cost containment components that could put you in a position where your next renewal costs you a lot more money. Do you wanna be registered or be a registered employer in that market, um, which likely will be required and have to pay taxes there? I don't know if you attended last week's session um, that Citrin provided on, on this topic, but this is a fascinating issue that is still being worked through and even will probably make its way to the Supreme Court in the coming year, but it is something you need to consider from a tax perspective. And you've got state laws to comply with now. A lot of people don't realize that within each state, there are employment related laws from a compliance perspective and your handbooks would need to reflect that, your employee handbooks and such. And then lastly, does their pay stay benchmarked to your office site or to their new location? Sounds a little bit nuts, but there are lots of articles out there, two in particular I'm thinking of, one in the Wall Street Journal back in September, where they interviewed tech firms and tech firms where the highest cost of living that exists in the country is in Silicon Valley and salaries are comparable to match that market. Their employees relocated to areas in Oregon and Washington state where the cost of living and the market levels were some 30% below. And those tech firms cut salaries for those individuals. Then you had um, company Spotify announced in the last month that they were not gonna do that. In fact, they were gonna benchmark salaries to where their headquarters were and not to where people lived. There is no um, clean answer to the question of what to do around this. These are just simply things that you need to consider as you look at an employee population that is now moving away from a commutable distance to your office. Some other keys around remote versus in office include again, consistency. Consistency is, is the hallmark, is a cornerstone for any best HR practice. You need to play this like a chess game and constantly be thinking how people are going to interpret your decisions, whether they are intended to be interpreted that way or not. But if you are consistent, you will stay away from a lot of the claims that you could potentially find yourself fielding about discrimination or unfair or inconsistent practices, um, favoritism, if you will, for certain individuals. You wanna be sure that there is centralized decision-making versus individualized divisional decision-making. The days of allowing managers to decide who works remotely and who doesn't should not be in the present, they should be in the past um, because otherwise you are looking at, again, an inconsistency issue. And again, watch out for adverse um, selection or discrimination potential claims here. A few more key points. On the home office side, um, there are all sorts of issues that are now starting to come to the forefront now that we're gonna be doing this on a more permanent basis potentially. So you have what I would consider to be sort of post COVID standards. Asking people to attest is the best way in our view to do this by giving them a checklist or by giving them a document to sign off on that confirms by their signing at the bottom that they have these standards in place, that they have a private dedicated workspace, however that is defined, that they are following best practices in ergonomics, which means you need to explain that a desk height is 29 inches, that a chair should have arms that are adjustable, that the chair itself should have adjustable height if the work surface they're sitting at is not 29 inches, or if they're not of a particular height. All things we haven't had to really think about in any significant way. Most of the time, these are taken care of us, um, taken care of for us by those people who purchase our furniture, who set up our furniture in our offices. We're losing that control. Tech, 
the internet speed is a huge issue and has been one that's been inconsistently handled by most organizations. But if you're going to make this relationship permanent, what are your standards and how are you going to, for example, establish who pays for those and who covers those? What you provide to your employee is not just about PC or monitors or a multifunction of piece of equipment. It also could be about um, it could be about internet. There may be therefore some stipend considerations where you, for example, establish a fixed um, amount one time only or a monthly or quarterly stipend that could cover things like internet speed or standards, depending on what it is that you want to establish that could cover furniture um, that could, um, but then on the furniture side, just to touch on this, and you know, this is where you need your accounting professionals to, to provide you with right guidance and direction. Is it your furniture or is it the employees? If it's your furniture and you may be able to take some benefits there associated with depreciation and such and the expense, are we actually planning on going to people's homes and picking desks up when their employment terminates? If we're not, are we asking them to drive it to the office to drop it off or are we just giving up on it? These are some variables that companies need to start really considering as they expand their footprint in remote work. Um, the, there, there are a lot of different variables on that front that, you know, again, um, bear, some, bear some thought. For readying your office for reopening, um, you've got to determine if you're going to really clean the slate versus adapting to the current layout. Um, a lot of organizations are rethinking who has assigned desks. Um, they're also first taking a look and see where the equipment is and is not, where the furniture is and is not, and filling those gaps. Taking a look at where your departments really need seating and where they don't and um, figuring out who's gonna really be in the office. Deal with higher traffic and occupancy days. We're advocating for clients to look at set, um, you know, one or two days during the course of the week where everybody comes in, if you're gonna have remote teams, if you're gonna have remote employees, but you're gonna ask them to come in a few days a week, might as well coordinate it so that everybody is there on certain days and you can optimize the presence of people for company meetings and other communications. Setting up TVs and screens to be able to allow for, when I say TVs, I'm, I'm basically talking about large um, uh, flat panels to be used as monitors that will allow you with use of Microsoft Teams um, and other tools of that nature to connect everybody and essentially incorporating more of those video tools. And then lastly, on the management needs and challenges side, managing split teams is going to be a big challenge. Managers are gonna need more training here because it's one thing to have them all manage um, remote teams for the most part, fully remote, but now with groups in the office and not in the office at the same time, that's gonna put some weight on their um, shoulders. Establishing metric-centric performance standards for them is key for the remote people, including remote teams in collaboration and spontaneous discussion as a practice to make sure you don't forget those folks, how they run meetings and handling performance issues overall. And if you go the surveying route, you know, again, a lot of the surveying advice here is to use ifs in your statements. If we were to do this, if we were to do that, but ask people in a survey if they've moved, um, if they've given the choice, again, if they've give, been given the choice, where do they want to work from? Um, asking them about their home office setup, asking them about their plans to vaccinate is a controversial piece. So it bears some, um, some questions about what it is that you want to do with that information and whether you collect it on an anonymous level or not, the an anonymity will help you ask questions of that nature more so than asking people to tell you who, um, you know, who they are when they fill that information out. Um, and then lastly, I'm sorry, my last point here is our best advice is you know, on vaccines really to sit tight for now and let more of this shake out. Let the federal and state governments provide us all with much needed advice, standards, and direction moving forward. But on a 2021 um, plan, really something focused on the latter part, last third of the year, line up that task force, have a strong HR voice in the mix, ask what others are doing and track the trends, talk to your peers, consider out of market recruiting as a strategy, it has great advantages, and communicate to your teams. And with that, I will throw it back to Steve. David, that was terrific. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. A lot of really uh, interesting topics for companies to consider in the coming coming days and months. Um, so we've had a lot of questions come in, uh, and I'll, I'll start uh, throwing a few of these over to you. I'd like to remind everybody, it looks like there's a few folks with their hands up. 
Um, we don't do live questions on these webinars. So if you could just use that Q&A box to, uh, to type them to us, that would be great. And, and we will answer them now. Um, so first question, David, you know, how do, can you have bimodal sets of rules for different groups of employees? If you've got certain employees that need to be in the office uh, and can only be productive in there in the, if they're in the office, are there, what are the pitfalls of having two sets of rules for different groups of employees? No, you should absolutely have the, the, the rules. I think that the, the key thing is overall, make sure that you have something that's defensible, that, that doesn't seem like you've made rules for Jim that are different from Judy, but they're doing the same job. So you have to be able to articulate in some fashion, ideally in writing, what the guidelines are for the most part for those people who you've chosen to give the opportunity to work remotely versus those in the office. Someone as a receptionist, for example, is a, is a really good one, and maybe even your IT people. Those jobs really require hands-on face-to-face communication with people. So that's a way to be able to define it, is that roles that involve inter, um, interface with clientele where we believe that you're going to have to do so, internal or external clientele, and you'll have to do so only um, smoothly or, or seamlessly in an office setting, that's how you establish it. With that said, you do get to decide what, you are, what your rules are. You can play and should play dictator here. So it's not a matter of you debating it and doing so in front of a judge per se. Just be clear on what your guidelines are and make sure that they're clearly and an and, and, and ideal scenario documented for your employees. And then that everybody who is communicating them is following the same set of documented rules versus coming up with their own. That's great, that's great, thank you. And is that is that where should should employers start to relook at their their uh, employee handbooks during these types of discussions and make sure that they're they're properly differentiating those groups of employees? Is there some sort of best practice around that? Yeah, the, the quick answer is step one is to do the task force piece and okay. sort out sort of the answer to the question, what does your workplace going to look like as of, let's say, September 6th? Once that's done, step two is to take a look at your handbook, cross compare it with the new rules of the road that you're establishing and put in place a plan for updating that book to ensure that what policies you have in your handbook are matching your new practices for a post-COVID workplace. Excellent, okay. Um, when it gets to, you know, there's a lot of pent up demand for to get employees together in person, do social gatherings and barbecues. Again, we got barbecue season coming up. Are, is there any advice that you're giving to your clients right now about how to approach those types of out of office social gatherings over the next several months? Yeah, so if the organization, if your company is the one that's organizing these events, Outdoors is obviously going to create much greater chance of you being able to get people to participate than anything that is inside. The key is to stay away from being judgy about whether somebody chooses to or not chooses to attend or participate in the same way as others. Um, this is the biggest concern we have right now with our clients is that you're going to invite everybody um, to an outdoor event, let's say, but you're gonna start going to within three feet of somebody and they're gonna start backing up and someone's gonna make a comment, you know, uh, you know I'm vaccinated, um, you know, aren't you vaccinated? You, you need to be respectful and mindful of the fact that there are a lot of complexities around why people are reluctant and reticent to re-enter a pre-COVID style of their life. Mm -hmm. And that has to be your focus. So you have to be mindful and respectful of these different standards that are out there and allow people to do what is comfortable for them. And if they opt out, they opt out. And if they choose to stay 10 feet away from everybody, it's okay. The more accepting you are of that, the less of the minefields you're gonna create for your organization down the road. Excellent, okay. Um, when, in this dynamic environment right now, when do you think there's going to start to be more established best practice guidelines for things like stipends, uh, how, it, how companies are including those in pay rates? I, I would assume most of this isn't, uh, isn't filtering into the data that we have quite yet. Is there an expectation that it will at some point? Yeah, so I'll answer it this way. In our business, everybody calls us to ask us what everybody else is doing. Um, and, you know, and, and, and so somewhere that has to, someone has to start and take the lead and say, here's, here's what we're doing. Right now, that information is starting to build. So uh, to be very precise and answer your question, at least on a stipend side, companies have started to establish what those look like. I would expect that you will start to see more broad distribution of that kind of information in the next 60 days. 
through surveys, through articles, through the press. And then organizations like ours that have a great reach with a large base of clientele will start to put that information out as best practices as well. Excellent. Okay, very good. Very good. Um, you mentioned the surveying of the of your employees uh, for their, their post COVID view. Is that how, how is that happening right now? Is that work that you guys are doing? Are there best practices around how companies which companies should be asking in those surveys? Yeah, so we are doing it. And a lot of the time we are doing it because there's a lot of benefit and safety in having a third party administer this. For, for one, we understand how to ask the questions. And for another, employees may be more comfortable with a third party collecting that data than the actual employer themselves. And then, as I said before, there's an art associated with how to ask these questions. You don't wanna ask people, do you wanna work remotely the entire time um, you're employed here? when you're not prepared to provide them with that benefit. Um, you want to ask questions in a way that gives companies room to be able to choose, you know, maybe not necessarily the things that they have asked or requested. So case in point is don't ask people if they um, don't plan to come back to work um, or if they would prefer to continue to stay where they are located, not in a commutable distance to your office, if you're not prepared to have an employee working out of state from another location um, on a 24 seven basis. So it's there, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot more surveying activity through us versus clients that are doing these on their own. Excellent. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in on the tax implications, specifically state and local tax implications. Um, rather than answer those on this webinar, what I do is direct uh, you folks who have those kinds of questions to our C-Suite Snacks page on our website. Eugene Revere, a partner in our uh, state and local tax practice gave a webinar last Thursday at this very time on that topic. Um, and his deck is there, the recording is there, and you can also reach out to him directly um, with, with any of those uh, tax questions. And David, I think we'll do one more question to wrap it up, nice specific one. You and I are both in Connecticut, so we've had to deal with this a lot this year. Any prevailing thoughts on policies for remote workers when there's power outages? Yeah, you know, that, that's one of those things where I look at it as sort of the snow day um, routine. Um, when, when we had snow days prior to COVID, you took whatever you could get in terms of productivity out of those teams. And it was all great because we knew somebody home at the snow day was probably home also with kids, may not necessarily have had the full complement of equipment to be able to effectively perform. So the performance um, and the productivity bar was very, very low. I think the same thing here is true, but, but it is a consideration as companies decide how much they want their people to work remotely because the more they work remotely, the more they may run into those circumstances. And so one of the questions we have posed in some of the surveys we have done is to ask the employee how often their power has gone out in the last year. And then we've given them a range to check it off. And when you have somebody who's indicated 15 or more days, let's say, that they didn't have power. Ask the second question in the same survey, do they have a generator? Do they have some type of power continuation piece? Those may be variables that will drive whether or not you want to allow an individual to continue to work or, or work remotely. Or you may establish a protocol that says that individuals who have excessive power outages may be required to be recalled to work on site either part on a, on a temporary basis or on a full-time basis. You want optimal flexibility to ultimately get one thing out of your organization. And that's the highest level of productivity that you possibly can. And that's within your purview as an employer to do. Well, David, I think that wraps it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, for everybody on the webinar, uh, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with a link to the recording of today's session a link to the deck and also contact information for David. So feel free to um, uh, you know, share that link with, uh, with your other people at your company, with colleagues, and you know, certainly feel free to view that material and reach out with additional questions or um, uh, concerns about at your specific COVID reopening plans. Uh, really, really great session today, David. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Um, as I said at the beginning, I encourage you to sign up for our mailing list. If you go to citroncooperman.com and our In Focus page, this is the first link. Uh, it's our C-Suite Snacks content hub. Uh, so go to that content hub, sign up for our mailing list uh, to make sure that you get invites for every week at 12 o'clock. 
We're going to be branching this series out in the coming weeks as well. We're going to be running what we call master snacks, uh, which are packages of 30 minute webinars on a specific topic. Uh, today will be included in one of those sessions for HR and talent. We're going to be doing one on cryptocurrency. We're going to be doing one on cybersecurity uh, in the near term. So get on that mailing list. Be sure to get invites for when the uh, first sessions of those master snacks courses come out and to make sure that you get the invites for uh, the off cycle, the non Thursday sessions that uh, those will be held on. Uh, additionally, we'd like to draw your attention to what's coming up. So continuing our series on HR and talent. Next week, we're going to be uh, joined by ADP, who are gonna talk about taking a more data-driven approach uh, to evaluating labor costs, improving employee engagement and employee management. Uh, they're gonna show off their, uh, their great data set. It's probably the biggest set of employee data available uh, and, and gonna demonstrate how you can use that data to get make better decisions about your talent. On the April 1st, we're gonna be kicking off our cryptocurrency series with a, a basic primer to explain how people are making money in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Anybody attending that session is also gonna get invites to another four or five sessions uh, on, uh, that go deeper into that topic area. Uh, and then on April 8th, uh, Mike Camacho, a partner in our technology risk advisory and cybersecurity practice, uh, will be presenting on how to prepare your company uh, in the age of a hacker. Uh, so uh, a couple of really interesting sessions coming up. The winner of our snack basket today is going to be William Matchkey. So uh, William, congratulations. Somebody from our team will be reaching out to you to get uh, shipping information. As always, we thank you for joining us on Thursdays at 12 o'clock for our C-suite snack session. Hope you enjoyed today's session and we hope to see you on future, uh, future ones as well. Have a great rest of your week, a great weekend, and we hope to talk to you all soon. Thanks a lot.